gentlemen, welcome back to podcastjuice.net. My name is Michael Dean. Joining me today, Mr. Ant Poo, sir, how are you? I'm doing good. Today, we are here to talk about, at long last, the book by Morris Day, On Time, A Princely Life in Funk. And this is written by Morris Day with David Ritz. And we, of course, we did a show doing sort of a preview of this. And now we have the book. We have both read this book. And let me say this off the top. First part of this review is not going to be spoiler heavy and hopefully no spoilers at all. So for those of you who have gotten the book and haven't had a chance to read it or are looking forward to reading it, I don't want to ruin the experience of the things that will come off the page when you read it. So for this first part of the review, there will be no spoilers. We would definitely let you know if we get into that territory. Uh, my quick thoughts on this book. I really, really love this book. I, um, uh, let me say this Morris day surprised me because I wasn't, quite sure where he was going to go with this book. I didn't know what to expect in terms of, you know, essentially Morris kind of having a, uh, a conversation with Prince. So I call ghost Prince and how that would play out. Would that be hokey or would it be like, um, how should I say, be like sort of, uh, maybe this isn't the way to go, but the way it is handled with storytelling here, I thought was brilliant. Uh, there are times when it is downright hilarious. Uh, the, the conversation between the two. Uh, but what I think what it does best is it almost kind of like um, sits in the way uh, it's almost like the reader or like the real hardcore Prince fan that would, that's going to say, ah, oh, well you ain't nothing without Prince or, you know, what about this part Morris? It is almost as if that ghost Prince sort of acts as that. Uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe even how close that may be, how Prince may have reacted to some of these things. Um, whoever's idea it was to use that, uh, I tip my hat to them because this makes the book come alive more. And it sort of stops at the gate to me a lot of the, oh, we're well, just doing this for this reason or he ain't telling us the full story. It, it offers some pushback to Morris on certain things. And Morris pushes back too. Like, so it to me, it was like, I would say is it is the best Prince book uh, uh, about Prince that was written by, by somebody who's actually there. Um, and unlike all of these books about Prince, and there are quite a bit, this is now my favorite uh, because one, it is not uh, somebody's interpretation of what they think about Prince. Uh, it is a person, Morris, who was there from the giddy up. Uh, who was in the studio working with him. Of course, we all know who Morris Day is. He's an icon in that, you know, the Minneapolis funk and, and coming out of that. And to see his perspective on some of the events in Prince's career, to me, was very interesting um, to hear some of the other interactions between the two of them at various degrees in their lives is uh, an eye opener to me. Uh, of course, we've heard the stories of the early stuff when, you know, was the time overshadowing Prince or did Prince feel some kind of way about them? But to me, this gives a little more uh, insight into their uh, dealings with each other back then and things that Morris was around that I wasn't even aware of. And in his vantage point of some of these, you know, bigger moments, um, and again, I don't want to spoil any of this right now, but even just like, how did he view Purple Rain? What he says about Purple Rain in this to me from his perspective, it was very interesting and we'll get into it a little later, but it was things like that. And even later on in life, uh, things that were going on. And again, what I also liked about it was that I'm a fan of Morris. Like I've bought, I think I've purchased majority, if not all of his albums over the years and so I was curious. I was like, I know he ain't going to talk about guaranteed the, the new Jack, new, new Jack swing Morris. That was trash. He ain't going to talk about that. He talks about that. I was like, okay, damn. All right, Morris. And then some of this other stuff. So it was very interesting uh, read. I really liked when he uh, talked about his life and some of 
his uh, let's say shortcomings or lessons that were learned throughout his life. You know, I read this as a father, so it was very interesting to read how he, you know, was a father early on with all this stuff, which I did not know. And then the couple of different marriage situations and how he did, a, did certain things within his relationships with his family. Uh, that was very interesting to me. I, the, the thing I would ding it for, I would say, I wish he went a little more deeper into himself in terms of, cause I was just curious, like as, as a father and a man, like his relationship with his sons, you see some pictures of them in the book, but I was very curious um, how he sort of reconciled or did he have some regrets from some of the decisions that he made? And I was just, I, don't know, I was just curious of his relationship with them. Um, I say that again, because they are featured in the book a little bit. Uh, there's something that happens with that, with his family. It's, I was curious how that affected them. And I also remember in one of the later Prince interviews, Prince mentioned Morris's kids. You know, he was making a point to say, like, maybe we'd get Morris's son in the studio. And we'll start doing music for him and that type of thing. I don't know if you remember that. So I was just very curious about that. Um, but all in all, uh, for me, I have a rating system. Um, I call them Marlins. Uh, you, you remember the uh, Marlon Jackson, not Marlon. Um, yeah, the Marlon Jackson video clip from the Victory Tour where Marlon's going. Oh, on. yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so, Michael's looking at him yeah, like yeah. this. And so and that's how I rate things. So, was, you know, out of five Marlins, I would give this four. So you'll see on the screen, I'm giving it four out of five Marlins. This is a must buy uh, for anybody who is uh, a fan <laughs> of you know, Prince Morris Day, and you wanted to hear more about that time, you got to get this. Uh, it actually offers a great insight into the music that they were listening to back in the day and the things that were being influenced. Uh, so in terms of talking about their funk music, the Minneapolis funk and the, the musicianship and, and, and making the bands and all that, I say he's a music person. You should definitely check this out. If you want to get into if you want to uh, study somebody's career in the music and entertainment, you should pick this book up. It's, it's a very, you can, I read this in one night. Like, I was like, okay, let me start this. Oh, you, I, I got joking. No, I'm not joking at all. Wow. <laughs> like I was, I was like, cause I, you know, I've been following these cats from day one. So I was, man, I, I needed to know. This is like the, 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 the Holy grail for me. I was like, Oh, this, oh okay. Yeah. Oh, you know? So yeah, I, I burned through this. Uh, wasn't fast. It wasn't, you know, it could have been even more, but, but I loved it. I was never bored. So yeah, four to five Marlins, uh, and Pooh, man, what'd you think of, uh, on time? For me, this might be, and I'm, I'm really trying, I, I've been sitting here listening to you trying to think of a better, okay, actually this is the second greatest autobiographical book behind Malcolm X for me. Whoa. And it's not, and it's not so, and I say that like I've read so many, <laughs> But I'm just saying the ones that I have read, yeah, this would be number two behind Malcolm X. Um, the way that it was written, <clears throat> the way that he was very candid, he didn't b BS us with. I, I really can't think of anything that he said where I'm like, man, you BS it. He, he, he kept it real. I think he kept it too real about his relationship with Prince in certain spots. Like, for example, there's a chapter where he's talking about musicology and he goes into really vivid details about the musicology video. And I'm sitting there like, OK, next. <laughs> I'm like, why are you talk doing so much talking about that? But just overall, he sets the stage. And I don't know whose idea it was. Maybe it was more. It's like he's saying still hearing Prince's voice. But to put that in the book and have this other voice, like he's still talking to Prince and as he's, um, I, I say that the, the Prince character in this book is kind of like the bullshit filter. <laughs> like, it's like, he's saying something that's like, yeah, well, you like that money though. Or, or like, yeah, it's like you were good, but you weren't always on time. And I'm just looking like, damn, yeah, he's call. It's like Prince is calling him out on his stuff throughout all the years. And is and I'm not saying Prince was trying to blame Prince. I mean, Morris was trying to blame Prince for certain things. But it was like that the ghost Prince was like checking him like, no, 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 that's on you. No, 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 that's on you. And Morris 
I, it was really refreshing. He owns up to it. He really took a been. He really was self reflective. He said he kept saying numerous times about he hated going to uh, therapy. His wife kept pushing therapy, therapy, therapy on him. Well, it looked like it worked. I'm sorry, I'm going to diverge for a bit. For those for those of you people, especially my black people, that look at therapy with this negative lens that is trying to make you tell you there's something wrong with you or put you on drugs, you need to read this book or get the audio and see how it affected Morris Day. Because when you see the way he's looking back on his life and his career, you can see that he's really come to, to peace with not only the things that he did, the things that he did to mess up his career, which he fully owns, and then look back and say, you know what, if I had done this, cause he, and he actually, I'm sorry, somewhat spoiler, <clears throat> the final chapter, he actually goes back and says, this is how it should have been done. Mm. But he does it in a way like, I'm at peace that I didn't get to that height. So for me, I absolutely love this book. And it's not because the the, the Force Ghost, the, I'm sorry, the Prince Ghost thing to me makes it so entertaining. I feel like you I feel like this whole book should be a movie or a series. I want Ava DuVernay on this cuz I she was supposed to do a prince documentary. I'm like, well, the prince is staying ain't, ain't uh playing a uh, ball with you. Netflix may not uh be funding it right. Go take this and I think it'll be a hit. Absolutely loved it. Um the one thing I will say is I feel like there were a lot of things that were going on. The formation of the time, going through Purple Rain. He, he went into details, but I f- felt like he could have went into more. Leaving the time, I felt like he glossed over some things. And I'm not saying it was malicious to, to, uh, to, to, to not paint anyone in a bad light. I just felt like maybe there were some edits where it was taken out or for, cause for some reason I'm like, I know there's gotta be a better story about why you left Prince's camp. Um, the, uh, they, they kind of addressed that in the book a little bit. The, the Prince characters like you know, you're leaving a lot of stuff out. Oh, and, yeah. And Morris is like, yeah, I ain't, I ain't putting all my business. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he got to the nineties, I mean, let me know if you don't want me to bring how far you want me to go with this, where he's talking about when he got really low. I just felt like, OK, the 90s was 10 years. <laughs> and I'm like, I feel like there's more to this story that he didn't that he left out. I mean, he gave you just enough to to get from point A to B. But I just felt like there was more there. So uh, I can't speak. I cannot speak much more higher praise about this book. Number two. Behind the autobiography of Malcolm X. That's says Wow. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, for that's me, your opinion. for me. That's your opinion. All right. Now, to be fair, I, I'm sure Mike has probably read far more uh, hey. uh, bi- biographies than I have that I'd be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I I think I have a good 10 that we read cross reference and I can say, yes, this one is above this one is above it. All right. I ain't mad at you. Um, all right. So from here on, if you do not want to hear any details or stories from this book, this is the time to stop because we're, I, I wanted to ask a start here. What was uh, was there any uh, particular moment that you that really jumped out at you uh, during the book? The one that jumped out at me, which I, I know <laughs> is going to be blowing up the pages of Prince.org, Housequake, the Facebook group. Is when Morris said, wait a minute, my mother was trying to get a deal for all of us. And Prince was out in Hollywood with Chris Moon and got a deal for himself with a demo with us playing on it. Mm. I, when I got to that part, I was like, wow, holy. And I was the moment I said that, I went into the chat. I was like, yeah, the Purple Army going to be in their feelings <laughs> when they read that part. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a big thing to say, but you know, for me, I can't call it. You know, I, that's how he felt. He that, and I wonder. I don't know if the other band members felt that way. I suppose we could reach out to some people, but it is a big revelation. So he essentially is saying that the demo tape that was used to get the record deal was the band's demo and not necessarily Prince playing by himself demo. Uh, and it sounded like you know it was a, sort of one of those stories of when the lead singer lead a group and goes off and gets his own deal, 
you know, you, you kind of leave everybody hanging. And it seemed like that that's how he was saying, like, yo, he just left us. We was pretty much done when he left. You know, we had been putting in all this work. And, you know, he was saying his mom, you know, uh, was with the manager and trying to get deals. And lo and behold, you know, he made a move. And, you know, and it's very interesting because that type of stuff happens. When yeah. it be a cat in the group. And they obviously, you know, very talented. And they go off and do their own thing. And, you know, it, you know people, oh, man, what happened? Some on, on one side, you would be like, well, this is a business. And, yo, let yeah. me make this move and get it popping. Or you could be bitter about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, man, you effed us. And but it sounds like, you know, it's an interesting story because, you know, when Morris, he talks about it. And then you see, you know, he ends up going to work what I call these soul crushing jobs. You know, yep. while Prince is doing his thing. And that's that's the part that I really liked about this book, because I know a lot of cats go through stuff like that where they want to do whether it's their music or whatever it is. But then, you know, you got to pay bills. You know, Morris had a little baby, you know, uh, and he was young. It was his mom's. And, yo, you got to work. You know what I'm saying? How am I going to eat? Uh, uh, but your man, is that your man? On, you know, he's talking about playing the radio and they heard, mm -hmm. heard Prince. Oh, that's my man. You know, everybody probably... Yeah, stop it. <laughs> no, I was in the yeah. studio with homie. Okay. What you doing selling yeah. rental yeah, cars you, here? You hear selling rental cars. Stop. You know, and that can be one of them things that really man, I I should be out there with my people. That they doing it big. And I to me, and then you know, him being, you know, having a child and having to feel like you do have to be responsible, but this ain't working. And, Man, I will just go back to Minneapolis and see if I can get put on again, and to humble himself to go back, mm -hmm. get back with Andre, and they're like, "Yo, man, go on there, go on there and see homeboy, man. It'd be good to see you. You know, get 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 on again." And to be able to, he didn't come in there. Oh man, you owe me. You know, you. I was in the group. And he didn't come with that type of energy. It's like, my man, see, so you know how to work a camera, for sure. Let's get this. I'm ready to get, I, I'm trying to get in the game. And I, I was like, you know what? That was dope, man. That was yeah, the best would, decision he could have made. <laughs> yeah. I would love to know how, how other want to get put on people would have handled that situation. Cause he, 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 he portrays it like Prince knows he's a dope ass drummer. But he's like, nah, you, you ain't for my band. I got this white boy for my band because I'm trying to, which was, he kept bringing that hammer and that point on. I'm trying to <laughs> put this image out here because I, I know what's going to work. What's gonna, and he, he really, he went into really good detail about crossing over and why that All was right. important and, and how Prince was doing it. Uh, how Prince was uh, putting his plan together strategic, to do that. Man. He was strategic yeah. with it. Even if it looked like, if, again, a certain cat can be like, oh, you going to have these cats on here? You ain't going to have us? Nigga, we'll run these fools. We'll run circles over these cats. And, you know, now you can look at the wisdom of Prince with the game. He was, yeah, I know that, but let's get the bag first. Like, <laughs> Let me get in. It's like, you know. Like you said, don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah, you know. That, and I'm going to get on the field. Exactly. I got to get on the field to exactly. score. You and, play, you, you know. Play, he, you play this this position real quick. And, and I would, and the thing about it is, is the fact that, I mean, he, he might be sugarcoating this. You never know. I mean, this is sure. his regulation. But we'll take him at his word that he was like, man, y'all do it. But I mean, can you just imagine some of the, some of the, the old, can, can you imagine Rakim, who's, who's, Known as one of the great, and I'm uh, Morris and Rakim probably not the same level of reverence. <laughs> well, you already went with Morris and Malcolm, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, can you can you imagine like Rakim, who, who's a who's a dope MC, goes to run the MC, and they're like, "Yeah, can you hold this camera?" And I'm not saying he probably would have lost his shit, but I, he's like Morris wasn't. Some wasn't some dude off the street, like he said. Prince, he was collaborating him, helping him uh, create some of the the songs that he did. And he's like, "Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, that's real cool. Hold this camera." And he did it. How many of y'all are willing to hold the camera when you know you should be in the studio or you know she you should be in the boardroom helping to make the decisions, make this creative? Now, now, now the real question is. <laughs> And here's one of the parts that stood out in the book for me. How many of you niggas is ready 
to put some makeup on your man's back <laughs> before you get on the mic. <laughs> That's the real question. See, Morris Day was a writer. He was he was ready. He was man. Listen, chapter thirteen. Morris just threw this in here, it was, and I think he was kind of like talking about paying dues or something. But he was he described something during the is it the controversy tour or dirty mind tour one of the two, and he was like he was still the cameraman, and Prince was like, "Yo, man, can you uh rub some?" Oh, he didn't say rub. But can you put some? <laughs> <laughs> can you put some makeup on my back? And Morris, okay, and and he was like, "I I, I gotta find what he said because he was uncomfortable." He's like, oh. "You know, huh? You know, I did it, but." <laughs> you know that was some wild, some wild ass shit out there. Um, and, and again, yeah. Morris Day, I, I, I say he's a legend. He he helped contribute to the time. He helped contribute to Prince's music. He's a he's a pretty good. He's a pretty well known celebrity. But this is how he got his start, dude. He was uh, going on a basketball court with dude. He was in a band with. And this is what he was doing to try to get some studio time. And on the here's the other cold part about it. He wasn't trying to get to be the band leader of a of the time or any band. He was trying to play drums. And that's what he was doing. And, and this is a question I wanted to ask. Before, remind me, I'm gonna come right back to that because that was a big question I wanted to ask. I just want to read this one. This is the only part I'm gonna read out of this book. Am I my chatty patty? Yes. Deal with it. Uh here's another super strange scenario. This is Morris. During that same tour, this Dirty Mind tour, talking to Prince, he said, you asked me to apply makeup to your back. All of this was happening when I had not yet been granted my position as a musician. I was still your videographer, still a gopher. I didn't see myself refusing any reasonable requests. Was this a reasonable request? Uh, Ghost Prince, don't make it seem like something it wasn't. Morris. I didn't know what to make of it. Still don't. All I can say is that it gave me the creeps. I didn't know whether I was being teased, tempted, or tortured. We never discussed it. Nothing to discuss. Except, <laughs> except that I was made to feel like your ballet until you got famous with your own ballet. But mm. th that, that whole part is just hilarious to me. <laughs> teased, tempted, tortured. It, it reminds me of the bathroom scene and under the cherry moon. <laughs> I was like, where does that come from? But, but you know, Prince is on some other stuff. And hey, it is what it is. But I wanted to go back to the part about Morris wanting to just be the drummer of the... See, here's what I don't understand. If the Time album was already recorded, and then Prince is like, well, we need to put a band together for this. So then he goes, Morris goes to recruit Flight Time, right? Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. Jelly Bean, Monty, Alexander O'Neill is going to be the singer. What was Morris going to be doing? If you have Jelly Bean already playing the drums and you have Alex being the lead singer, how could Alex be the lead singer if the album is already recorded with vocals? I was really, I, that's what threw me. And I was like, I never thought about this before, but the way he put the timeline together, it would have seemed odd. Like would they have went on tour and Morris... Day would have been singing alongside Alex mm. live because Alex's voice is very different. He's a very manly, strong type of vocal. How, that's what that was like. I didn't understand what was the, what were they thinking on doing if the album was already done and the songs was already recorded. Were they going to go back and add Alex's voice, or were they just being like, "Fuck it"? And it almost made it seem like in the book he said that I think it was "Get It Up." was out already or something. Right, right. Yeah, that's like, a, yeah. He said that was the first one out. So I, that was odd to me. I, I was curious, like, what was... So what was Morris... Was he just going to be Jamie Starr too? Like, be in the background? He wasn't actually going to be up on stage with them or something? I I really don't know, especially when you've had so many people report that he was putting... Prince was putting the band together and Morris was going to do the drums. So I I, I have no idea. Yeah, but, but when, maybe what was Jelly Bean going to be doing? It, it's quite possible. That, that, yeah. So if we ever get him on the show, that'll be the first question to ask him. Like, <laughs> like, how did that work? Um, or he go was going to do maybe like what? Uh, well, not co-lead vocals, but you know, sub-lead, I guess. I don't know if, what you'd call it. 
Yeah, it would have been. I'm just saying it would have been very different from the record. Just adding with Alex saying period. That's what I was like. Okay. That would have been a different project, but. Yeah, there were so many things in here that uh, were just so anti. Uh, Morris's take on Under the Cherry Moon. That was very interesting. He called it out. Yeah. Like he said, he <laughs> called it out. He said, you was doing me. You was doing MD. Yeah. Oh, I guess we should let people know who MD is. Yeah, so there's another character in this book, MD, which, which essentially, I guess, is the, the actual Morris Day character that we all know. That, oh, you know, re- confident pimp, the player. Ain't nobody bad like me. Yeah, that, that character. And I was always thought that was very interesting because I always thought about Morris and I was like, he's always the, the Morris Day character. He's never like, you don't hear the sad moments from this guy or it's only just one style. You know what I mean? Like, and that's not a real person. Like, you're not going to always be, yes, you know, ah, well, baby, girl, you know. So it's interesting to hear him understand. Yeah, I was playing a character and then got sucked into that. And then yeah, I, I think it's very interesting and honest when he talks about in the later years, like that ain't, you know, I'm not really like that. Like, but what if I became that dude? And he, and he really talks about, you know, his ego and his attitude was out of control and, 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 and owning up to that. I think it was very interesting too. Um, that mess is this is a great book. I, I, I just want to jump back to you. I agree. This would be a monster, like miniseries type type of thing. I, I'm surprised somebody ain't already bought the, the rights up for this. Because they're making a movie about uh, Lisa Barber, right? Oh. The, the, the girl who won the Under the Cherry <laughs> the one, movie. Yes. How right. do they make a movie? And they can't. This is the movie right here. This is the story that you want to see. Not the girl who won the contest. Come on. Stop. Like I said, I think I think Lisa Barber is an interesting story, but if you want some the real print stuff, nah, this should be done before it, especially with the tone of this book and how it was done. I mean, can can you imagine you already tripping out Morris talking to a dead prince, and then all of a sudden here comes MD from Purple Rain? <laughs> like he's like, oh, what the hell? Um, one of the other things that's, that was interesting to me was um, the the musicology mm, tour yeah. and just his interactions with Prince later on in life. Uh, there's a moment in here, again, we're in spoilers. There's the moment where uh, Prince was like, yeah, y'all gonna open a tour up. No, wait, no, I'm talking about the show that they came to Minneapolis for. 777. Yes. Yes. That that That's was some game right there. Yeah, that, Pay attention to that. What, what's the what's the famous quote? It be your own man's. <laughs> it, the, here's the thing. I know the Prince Army are going to get in their feelings when they get to that one too, because people have come to damn near deify him and swear like, oh no, if he that, that ain't how it went. Prince, no, I, Prince was on his petty. He that was when I when you read this story, I really don't want to spoil it, but he did Morris in the time cold, if you, if this is to be believed. But here's the thing: so many people have these same stories, mm-hmm. so it, it can't all be everybody can't be coming up with the same uh, interaction with Prince, and it all be lies. Yeah, that, that's one of those situations that can happen between you, your boys, whatever, and you can be done. You can be done. Like, right. You know, I'm not fucking with this guy no more, man. Like, that that was, that was I, I was kind of like, man, what's the what's the reasoning, bro? Was there something else going on? But this, I don't know if the sad part about it, the, the reality of it, it probably was on some petty. Like, let me, you know, I'm in control of this. You don't, you, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just that kind of power, power level. Yeah, yeah, power yeah. type thing. And that stuff is, you would think at that point, y'all don't need to be doing that. But, and I was just like, wow. Yeah, I, I know. I was going to say, it, it must have took a lot for Morris to be like, okay, again? And, and you know what I mean? But again, we're hearing Morris's side. I right. don't know what the other side of it was. Uh, but the fact that there was at least the recoll- a recollection later on for them to come together in some sort of capacity, 
I thought that that was really tight to see. Because I just, to me, they were a lot older. These are older cats, you know. Morris is like, what, 60 something? Yeah, but even 62. 62. But yeah, even so, at that time. So this is, yeah. They're not young. I was kids. Say, so at the t- I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I yeah. I was going to say, at the time, they're in their late 40s going into their 50s. Yeah. And, and I'm just, that's why when I heard this, I was just like, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Now, again, you, it's one sided. We, and, you know, I will say one thing. I, other than, this is where I, I might want to call Morris out. Other than him fucking up on uh, the Purple Rain shoe, saying he's coming there high and late and clowning in the acting class, he never really said his side of things he didn't did to Prince. It can't all have been true. one way. True. Very true. Very true. Very true. Yeah, I mean, so that's, you, you made me think of Purple Rain. I found that very interesting that they had no idea what the movie was about. <laughs> you know, aside from Prince and probably the director and the producers, it's cast members and mm, arguably right. the co-star right. of the movie, Morris Day, had no idea what the hell they were shooting. That's <laughs> very interesting to me. Yeah, he was saying that they didn't see any of the dailies. They didn't see uh, a, a first cut, a second cut. No script. They didn't see, yeah, they didn't see the final thing till the premiere. Yeah, I mean, that's, and you know, not, uh, an actor not seeing the movie to the premiere is not necessarily odd, but the fact that they don't even know what the movie is about, mm, okay. it's very interesting yeah. to me because then you, you kind of, do you know what your motivation, the character is like, what is, so maybe that's why they're just playing themselves. You know enough to know that we actually do feel some sort of way about each other. So you can kind of play that on the screen a little bit, but that just, to me, that's a fascinating uh, admission because it's such an iconic movie and he was great in that movie. But looking at that now, it makes me wonder like, wow, was his character in terms of what he was doing? He wasn't probably thinking that he was the bad guy in the movie. Like, so when he, you know, you know what I mean? Like he might just That's think true. we're clowning, but uh, when he's probably, mm. I wonder, cause it, it makes me wonder, does he understand the magnitude of when he goes, how's the family? Did he even know what, what was going on? Or you just did that, you know, just like, just say this and then have this, rec- you know, we're going to have a shot of you kind of sitting there thinking, but what was he thinking? Did, did he think he was thinking about that? I was fucked up or he's like, oh, I, I left the, my other girl's side pieces drawers on the floor. When my other <laughs> chicks, <I'm> like, what? <laughs> what was he thinking? <laughs> so, so, man, I, that's, that was, that was interesting. And then again, there's so much, the graffiti bridge stuff. Uh, you know, <laughs> He kind of glossed over, I ain't gonna say gloss, but he kind of went through, rushed through that as well. Cause he, I, I thought that he would kind of like go into depth of like how bad this was or how um, this, the story didn't make sense. But at the same token, again, he didn't know what the hell they were doing. He just knew that he was now this big time uh, club owner and running things. Yeah, it's. And they had quite the relationship. Uh, last thing I'll say, you go on. I, uh, I thought it was very interesting uh, that when it was a time again later in their lives that uh, Prince had him come out to Paisley Park. They get in the studio, and he was kind of like, "Yeah, it's like old times. Like, oh, we coming up with some shit. Okay, bro, we we vibing. Let's get this." And then Prince is like, "Yo, man, um, we can do this, but." No, I'm parap- paraphrasing, but yo, you you need to you gonna have to you know study the Bible or get in this book with me. And Morris like, huh? Yeah, you know, and I I admire Prince for laying it out. At least he's honest. I don't, but it, to me, that's not some wild shit to do that. But it's at least he was honest to say, listen, this is what I'm on. If you ain't on the same page, we can't really rock together. And I m- admire Morris be like, you know what? Yeah, I ain't on it. Like, not like that. So I guess it is. Well, and then we just part ways then, bro. I ain't I ain't hear from him again. We ain't work on that music. It was a rap. I thought that, that was very interesting. It uh, some of these things really show, well, at least show Morris's interpretation of where he s- saw Prince at those times in the later years. To me, those are very fascinating <laughs> observations. Even the point where he talked about when they were at Paisley Park with the band. And Prince was in there holding court, mm, you know, preaching yeah, pulpit. and going yeah. in heavy on casting. They're like, 
huh? And we were just going in. And they was like, we had to take a break and then come back for part two of the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was that was fascinating to me. Mm. All right. So uh man, any any last words uh you want to say about this book? Um, for me, um uh, when he gets to that 90s period and he's talking about how he got to some of his lowest point, he was out of the music industry. Spoilers? Can I give some spoilers? Yeah, we're doing spoilers. Okay, cool. And uh, he living on his sister's couch. Mm. And as I'm lis- listening to it, yes, I got the audio book because I wanted to hear the whole, how this whole interaction went. I'm just thinking to myself, like, can you imagine? And I'm sure this, there's probably celebrities and musicians throughout the uh, the history of this industry that have probably been in this situation. But for me, this was the first time uh, seeing can you imagine 1984 you're on the number one uh film purple rain and like 10 years later you're kind of like out of the music industry you got i think you had two kids at the time you got a wife that's like look you either get your stuff together or we done but i'm moving over here i'm gonna get this education i'm gonna i'm gonna do what i gotta do to take care of provide for myself and my children and he's like, he's going into this depression and he has, he felt like there was no way for him to get back to where he was. And it's just, it was kind of sad to hear that. But at the same token, the fact that he went through that and and found a means to, you know, put the band back together, so to speak, not the original band, but, you know, a band nonetheless and tour and actually become relevant again. It was just like, it really makes you think that, yeah, you can get to that low point, but it's like, when you get there, what do you do? Do you, you just stay um, revel, not reveling, but staying with mired in that situation? Or do you actually make the necessary changes to get back to at least to some form of level where you were before? Yeah. That, and the other thing, I'm sorry, I would wind back a little further, was when we, when he uh, left Minneapolis and, you know, went with the family in Maryland. Then he went out to San Jose, which he said he hated. And then he finally, you know, tail between his uh, legs, went back to Minneapolis. The one thing that I like, and I hope people who read this book take away, he said he made a deal with himself that he was not going to do these BS jobs. He had a talent and a skill in music, and he didn't care if it was $30 a night or if it was uh, doing a jingle. I can't remember all the different uh, examples he gave, but he pretty much said that he was going to work in music no matter what. He was going to make a dollar. He was going to make money in music and was going to keep fighting to get that opportunity. And for me, it kind of it resonated with me. It's like, yeah, if that's what your passion is, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you believe you were put on this earth to do, then you, maybe you do have to take a $20 a night gig to get to where you want to be. And it, look where it ended up for him. Yeah, man. And, you know, going back to that sleeping on the couch thing, you know, I thought in that first part of the book, a majority of that book, his first wife really held him down. Uh, yes. And, oh, man. Yes, you know what I'm saying? And that's the only parts about the book I, I wish he was a little more self-reflective on, but I can understand why he wouldn't do that. Again, I'm speaking in terms of, you know, how his family may feel reading this how his sons may feel reading some of this stuff. So I was very curious, like he, even though, you know, he started to turn things around and he essentially just went back to what he was good at. It's like, go be Morris Day. You know what I'm saying? Like, go out there and get back on the road and do what you do. You don't have to be, you can't be Key Sweat. You know, you can't be <laughs> whatever's popping today. Just be Morris Day. And get back out there and do your thing. And I think to me, it's kind of like it seemed like his, uh, you know, his first wife really held him down. And she got out there and got the job, got better, got her stuff. But she never was, you know, what I mean, she just held it down, as a lot of women do. And I did find it interesting that and he admits to the infidelities out on the road and that type of thing. But even sort of to the point where you saw it seemed like, OK. He's he's on his second, you know, second run. He's older, he, you know, the second act. You know, he's doing his thing, but he still fell back in the foolery a little bit. And, and I only mean by that in the sense of because then he brings this other woman into the story. 
you know, his current yeah. wife, you know, and shout out to her. But it, it didn't really, I was looking for him to go a little deeper into all of a sudden he's just, in, he's in a relationship with this younger girl. And it was like all of a sudden this chapter and then this younger girl's pregnant, but he got a wife. I was like, whoa, what are you, bro? Mm-hmm. I, I, I just want to hit the butt, bro. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what are you doing, boy? <laughs> and then okay. he makes a decision to go and leave his family and, you know, start a new family. And I, so, and again, I have to respect this, this is that man's move. That's what he wanted to do. I, I was just wanting, I wanted him to speak on it as a man to be like, yo, this is the effects that it had on my family. Not just the positive effects it has on him to feel like, you know, yeah, I'm, things are going good and I'm doing a relationship with Prince and stuff. But I was very curious, like, how did his, how does he really, that has to somehow affect him. Does his kids feel abandoned? He doesn't mention his first wife anymore after that in the book. And he never put her in a light that she did anything wrong. I was just very curious. No, like, man, yeah, that's an indeed. interesting move. And I was very curious. What happened with that, man? Like, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if I was Lorena, I might be in my feelings reading this book the way he was uh, uh, push, pumping up Judy. That was her name, right? Judy? You talking about the first wife? The first wife, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you got, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if she was if she was very thorough, he'd be lying. Otherwise, I mean, it is what mm-hmm. it is. You came in. Yeah. So I'm not judging no way. I'm just saying it's a very, that's the very interesting story too. Like, Right. You know, but, uh, but yeah, all I can say is, yeah, it was, it was a hell of a book. Now, I don't know who's gonna hear this, but I ain't gonna lie. That that would, I have to take that back. I felt like that situation. This is me in the Caddy Patty, Chatty Patty, whatever. He kind of was. I ain't gonna say a little simpish, but he was kind of BS in the about how that went on. I'm just looking like it's like it was plain. Yeah, it was nigga plain. He was he was like like well you know, and, I, and I'm looking like man, stop it, stop it. <laughs> I'm hearing this like. Man, I know. I think he said she was 21 years younger than him. Yeah. <laughs> What's the thing? I was like, stop it. Yeah, I looked at the picture when I saw it. I was like, oh, boy, stop. <laughs> They're like, you, might, yeah, you probably didn't fall in love with it, but I, I'm just, the way you was describing the situation, he, he trying his best, to, he was trying his best to put the biggest spin on this shit. And I was like, stop it. We know the game. We know the game. <laughs> It's like Prince taught you that game, <laughs> right? <laughs> you either going in or you going out. <laughs> that was my wow. taste. Said. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah, that, that that was that was the only time where I wanted to be like, man, this is some BS. Come on, boys, <laughs> BS. Know this. We know the we know the game. <laughs> but yeah, he's in love. They married. Hey, I got kids. Like that. Yeah, yeah. It's what it is. But yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, good, good book. Like, listen, I know I'm like that preacher. This is the last thing. This is the other part that was interesting about this, and it's not just in this book, but it just goes to show everybody has some sort of insecurities or or something. What I mean by that, there's a part in the book that I thought was very interesting as well. When Morris said he he just rolled up to Prince's house in LA or something. This would have been Purple Rain 1999 era or something. <clears throat> and, he's, and he was just kind of Are you going there? Yeah, he was giving the story of just like You know, we was that cool I could just pull up, you know what I'm saying Hey, what's up Prince, come on through So he talked about he came over to the crib, right And there was some chicks there Everybody lounging, having a good time And some females was out he, and, and Prince wasn't outside or whatever And it sounded like they, they was kind of feeling them They were choosing them Yeah, they, they was choosing, choosing up on them up on <laughs> And Prince came out there uh, you gotta go, like, huh? <laughs> my man. Well, nah, you don't. You don't just come up in here. I, I thought that was. I was like, ah. now again, this is Morris's interpretation. I get that. So, I, so you, when you're in the, the feeling, in your feelings in the comments, I know. But I just thought it was interesting <laughs> that I'm like Prince could have anybody. He prints. I just thought that was interesting because there was another interesting, another part in the book he mentioned he called the the female Wonder Woman, and he was like, "Remember that time? Yeah, I was in, the, in the hotel with Wonder Woman, and we was all cool with a prince." And he was like, "Sometimes Prince, you would you'd be like, hey, yo, you have her.' Like that's 
he was on his uh, if the homies can't have none. <laughs> It ain't no fun if the homies can't have that type of scenario. I guess they used to have. It was like, oh, you you, you got that. You can have that one, Morris. I got. Or, I yeah, I already got what. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it was, you know, whatever. They young, but he was kind of like, yeah. Prince came in the room. He was heated. When old girl was in there, like, I never saw an old girl again. <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> I thought she chose him though. But it just goes to show that it don't matter who who you are. Some people sometimes. When you you don't think that they might feel some sort of insecurities or you feel like some there's some competition for the ladies and stuff, even the cats you think would be like, man, I got so many, I can't keep them all. Go on, you. Even even Prince was a little bit like, ah, man, it was mm. it was a little, and I'm I, I'm gonna say this and let the comments fly. It was a little, he was kind of hating sometimes, but that's but anybody, everybody does, right? It was a normal dude, I guess. Yeah, when I read that chapter, I was like, okay. I, I thought to myself, maybe I might understand Prince's point of view. I'm like, you you here for me. What you doing rolling up on my mans over there? It's True. like, I'm, I'm supposed to dismiss you. You ain't supposed to be low-key dismissing me. And I said, I put in the chat, I'm like, yeah, I would have said, Morris, you got to go and take them with you. They damaged good. Well, see, that, that's, that's the only thing I'm saying. You would have said that to the female. You wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. be mad at your mans. Not unless that was your lady or something. Right. Yeah. But if that was just, and he was like, oh, you choosing? Okay. You know what? Bet. I, and he was just, just walked up to more and said, I see you, Playboy. You got that. Ain't. Charge it to the game. And, and looked at homegrown, rolled his eyes if he wanted to. But you wouldn't, you would, <laughs> but you wouldn't come at your mans like that. You got a dude like that. I was just kind of like, that's interesting. But again, we all have our things. Again, Prince pulling them like ain't nobody's business. They throwing it at me. I would imagine. And, be- so, they ain't, yeah. and before y'all come from Michael Dean, oh, the come. urban legend is I Hate You is about Carmen Electra oh, right. and Tony M. So don't act like this is some some new revelation that, oh no, Prince, when he get down like that. Hey, you've heard the whispers. I was thinking this, the actual group. Like, what song you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, let me, yeah, let me stop for they go and lose their mind. But uh, yeah, fascinating book. Definitely a great read. So uh, last question. You listened to the audio book. How did that sound? How did they do the voices? He did a good job uh, uh, changing his voice to reflect Prince and uh, Mike and Moore's day. MD, he gave a little more like a slick jive. I hate saying that, wow. but yeah, a little jive Boy, accent to it, so you knew the the difference. But yeah, um, it definitely since you know what Prince and well, you, you've seen on film what Prince and Morris Day sound like. It's kind of jarring, but it did did do a good enough job to keep you interested and entertained by it. All right, well there you go, ladies and gentlemen. We definitely want to hear what you thought of the book, and I'm sure you have comments on what you thought we said. Uh, So certainly leave those in the comments. Uh, Listen, check us out at podcastjuice.net. There you can get your official Podcast Juice t-shirts. You can get your Working Like a Job t-shirts. So definitely that helps the show. Um, If you really want to help support us, join our Patreon page and get on board with that. Uh, Thank you, Ampu, coming through. And as we say, Working Like a Job, we'll see you next time. Peace.